So in Hemshir Chaim Beis, yesterday we went back and forth between Ayim Beis and Sadiq Dalad. For those of us that need a reminder, these are the two discourses that we're learning side by side. These are the discourses of the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, which is part of our series that we're learning here. This class is on Ayin Beis, which is short for Tafresh Ayin Beis. Means the year seven Ayin Beis in Hebrew seventy two, the year five six seventy two, corresponding to nineteen twelve. And uh, Sadiq Dalad is ninety four. Tafresh Sadiq Dalad corresponding to the year nineteen thirty three. So side by side, because it's the same theme, with elaboration by the Friedrich Rebbe, the sixth Chabad Rebbe, the son of the Rebbe Rashab. So what we're learning right now is on page, we're on page 1147, volume two. And we get, well, after discussing the two ends of the spectrum, the creator and the creation, meaning the source of cre- the source of it all, yes, Amiti, what he calls the true and absolute reality, and the created reality, which is our reality. He's explaining now the bridge between them, the process which the Creator God used to create, and the process through which we also return. So think of it like a highway back and forth between the highest to the lowest. When I say highest, I don't mean it's defining it by the highest, but meaning the beginning of it all, source of it all. And this we call ayin. This is a state which is like a vacuum, a, uh, a, a shapeless, identityless. Essentially, it's not the yesh amiti, but it's also, but, but it's a reflection of the source. And maybe the word source is also should not be used because we define clearly that God can be defined as source. I mean, in the loose term, that which put everything else in place. And, it, and it, th- so it's a reflection of that, that like light energy is a reflection of that. And it's the source, this is source. It becomes the energy that energizes, creates and energizes existence, obviously with the creative energy from the creator, from God. And he explained that this ayin splits into two, breaks into two, one, that is closer to the source, meaning to God. It's a reflection of the divine, so it's far more representative of divine personality, quote unquote, and one that is commensurate and relates to existence. Now, there are many different names. This could be Er Erhabligvul, Erhagvul. He doesn't give it names yet, so I don't want to give it any definition, but it's similar to what we've learned about a light and energy that reveals the etzem, the essence, and a light that is commensurate and tailored to the universe and existence. And these are the two levels of ayin. So that one ayin splits into two. As we're going to learn later, obviously from the perspective from above, there's no two. It's all one flow. But when we look at it from below, from our perspective, it's two levels. Two levels of essentially of oil, if you want to put it that way. Okay. And why is and what's the cause? How can something split? What's the sibase schalkus? That's the words he uses. The cause, the 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 the, the force that causes it to separate. It says because oil, by definition, is subject to splitting, to diminishment, to levels. Ats me a core essence. It is what it is. He doesn't bring the expression here, but in other places he brings from the Baal Shem Tov, etzem kishu tefiz b'miktsosei, or bechelke te tefiz b'kulei. And etzem, even when you touch one drop of it, you're touching all of it. I'm not sure why he doesn't bring it here. Maybe that's a, a deeper element of it. Maybe you don't need that statement. But regardless, atzmi, as he said, what kamoshahu, whatever it is, it is what it is. It's not subject. You can't have a half of an etzem or a quarter of it. Then there's a thing called giluyim. Giluyim, like in this case, reflection, light, and energy, that is subject to diminishment. Subject, I mentioned, to hierarchy, to levels, to stages. And as such, as it transmits, it gets weaker 
and more diminished. And he gave the example of the era avuka, the light of a torch. When you're close to it, you're, it's brighter and, and more intense. And when you're more distant, it's not as intense. The torch itself, in this case, would be the atzmi. The torch doesn't change. What changes is the reflection and its extension, its expression. When you're close, you feel the intensity. When you're far, you don't. You're very far, you don't even see it. But the torch has not changed. Just he doesn't say that explicitly, but that would be the mushal and the nimshal here. The Friedrich Rebbe goes beyond this and gives the example that we learned yesterday. And again, this is 1147 IM base corresponding to page 51 in Sadiq Dalit. What did he say there? He compared it to the etzim hanefesh, nefesh, and the keiches hanefesh. That would be in the case like the torch and the light from the torch. Or in this case, atzmus, the yesh, amit, the, yeah, the yesh, the atzmi, and the oir. So what did he say? The nefesh is chai be'etzem. Its, it's, its definition is life. It's life. It's not receiving life. It is life. God created a nefesh chaya, we call it, a living soul. And therefore, it gives off life, chayas lahachis. And therefore, it extends itself by giving life to things. It gives energy and life to a body. That's what a nefesh is. So in the, in the moshe, let's say in the torch, the torch is, is light. I'm not going to call it an atzmi like atzmi and atzmus, obviously, but compared to the light of the torch, it is the, the light itself. And then there's the reflection of it, its expression, its extension, its hamshacha in Hebrew. It means its extension. Its hamshacha is subject to, change, to changes and levels. Same thing with the nefesh, as he explained. The nefesh is a chai etzem. Let me just read that. And that's why it's gilui, is chayes lahachis. So if a flame gilui is light and warmth, the sun's gilui is light and warmth. So a nefesh's gilui is chayis. It gives life. Then there's the kaychas a nefesh, the faculties. The faculties are not the etzema nefesh. They are an extension, an expression of the soul. That's why in the, in the chayis lahachis, meaning as the energy that the soul, the extension of the energy, the oir, oir ha-nefesh, let's call it, the oir b'chayes ha-nefesh that extends into the body, there's a difference between the mind, the heart, the legs, and so on. They have different levels, they have different functions, and they have different levels of energy that they receive as faculties. Like he says, you can't compare the mind to the toenail. <clears throat> but in the chayis, meaning the life force that it gives, not the functionality, the life force of the soul, everything is alive equally. It's one life force from head to toe, literally. That's what he says, head to toe, from the mayak shabarash to the sepeyan shabaregel, to the toenail. Even though in their geluyim they're different, but in the etzim achayis that they get from the nefesh, there's equal. And he compared it. He says, even though it would be a consideration to say that a large body has a larger soul, it needs more energy, and a small body is less as a smaller soul, eg melech and the giant, compared to a, a child that's one month old child, says, but that's not the case. Because a nefesh is an atzmi, and as an atzmi, the same nefesh can give life to a large body, to a small body. As we get older, the nefesh doesn't become more powerful in life force. We're not talking about immaturity and mind growing and your heart growing and your faculties are more powerful and your body is stronger. You can't compare a 20-year-old to a two-year-old in strength, but in chayis, is a 20-year-old more alive than a two-year-old or a one-year-old or one-month-year-old? What makes him more alive? I'm talking about the life force, the biological life force of the soul inside the body. So he says the same way as it is the nefesh compared to the bodies, the same is true, the nefesh compared to all its, all the limbs and organs. The same thing, it's an equalizer. 
the same chayis from the head to the toe, just like the same chayis from a large body to a small body. In one body itself, it's also an equalizer. Again, we're talking about the general chayis kloli that it gives life. Another place in the Chassidus talks about a chayis proti. A chayis proti is another story. Just to give an example, to bring a machine alive, an appliance, the ref, a, a, a computer, or, a, uh, or anything, uh, a, a refrigerator. So to bring it alive, you need electricity that the whole thing is now a working, functioning appliance. Obviously, there are parts of the appliance that heat up more than other parts. Let's say in a computer, the hard drive needs a fan because there's a lot of heat there. There are other parts that are just uh, details. So obviously, functional-wise, some of them are far more need more energy for them to function. But as far as the machine goes, the machine is one machine that's now a functioning machine. You can't say that electricity only runs into half the machine, not the second half. The same thing with the body. If you talk about function, yes, the, the mind, the brain, the, I'm sorry, the head releases more heat than other parts of the body. Where there's a lot of functionality, there's more energy going on. But that's energy in the function of the, that keli, so to speak, the earth and the keli, not of the life force. You can't say one piece of a body is more alive than another part of the body. The chayis kololi, which he's talking about here, that comes from the atzmi, is an equalizer. Okay. But the oil is different than a koyach, no? You're talking about the nefesh, that there is the koyach a nefesh, and there is the etzim a nefesh. When you're talking about atmos, where is the oil belongs? The oil is a reflection. I, I'm not sure where you say this distinction. Right here, koyach and ha'ara and oil are all the same category. Where do you see the distinction between koyach and oil here? I'm asking here, you a question. for the practical world. purposes like oil. Gilui ma'anefesh. Koyach is not gilui ma'anefesh. It's the oilus ma'anefesh. It's not here... He's not loy nochis Here he's not into distinguishing koyach and oir. The oir, chayes, and koyach are three levels, but generally they're one category. And here they're talking about as one thing. It's not etzem. That's the that's the key. And the how about most of the nefesh? Is all the all is like yeah. You don't see the etzem here. How are you explaining that? I'm not sure what the, you're talking about. Where, where don't you see the etzem? You. In here, the gas miss any place. You don't wait, see wait, the wait. etzem. One second. What, who's talking about seeing the etzem? He's talking about why oir is sub that oir, which is only a reflection and expression, is subject to change and diminishment and levels. And atzmi is not. So the nefesh, the etzem achayis that comes from the nefesh, does not get diminished in one part of the body as opposed to another. It doesn't get diminished in a smaller body than a large body. It's a chayis slowly. It's a chayis that's equal coming from there. Whereas the giluyim absolutely are subject to diminishment. That's the theme here. I'm not sure where you're going here. He's not talking okay. about... No, I didn't understand the atmos. The atmos is... A He's not talking about atmos. He's talking about the oil. Why the ayin breaks into parts. Because okay. it's being a reflection. Not an atmi. It's subject to diminishment and hierarchy and changes and... And, and that, that's why it breaks into parts. The example for that is the light of the torch, which, which the Friedrich Rebbe brings afterwards, but the Rebbe Rasha brings, and in the Friedrich Rebbe's marshal, it's the it's the chai, it's, it's the Eir HaNefesh, the Giluyim from the Nefesh, as opposed to the Etzem HaNefesh, Chai Be'etzem, that gives life to the whole body. Ask your question and what I just said now. What's not clear in what I just said? Okay. And as I said, repeating again, the Friedrich Rebbe said, L'chayre, because it's an er primi, er primi, because the chayes sanefesh is ke'en, he says ke'en er primi. So that means that the soul and the body are like an er and a keli. So you would think it would be mokim b'seich leimer. I'm reading from Tzadik Dal on the bottom of page 51. To goof God, a larger body, a larger keli, since the air is entering the primis, not an air makif, a primis de you'd think 
that the air is an air godel in a larger body, in the body of, of a giant. The answer is no. Because the Atzmi, there's no such thing as larger and smaller, and therefore it's not mischalik. Sheena mischalik, mischalkus is like begiluyim, shehem akechus. Avlachayus who shove the chol ha'ivarim. The life force is equal in all the the ivarim. And he says, "V'tama dover who?" The reason is because chayus ha'nefesh who atzmi, va'atzmi gam kishabor become a fanim shenim and the essence, and a core essence essential. Also, when it comes in different manifestations, it remains an atzmi. Whereas Oyer is a reflection and expression, and expression goes through changes, as we discussed yesterday more at length. And then he goes back to the example of the Rebbe Rashab, of the, of the Eir Avuka, the torch. The now, emotion that gave electricity, it's probably not an Atzmi, because if it's a bigger machine, you need more electric. The source of electricity is an Atzmi. The generator, wherever it generates, wherever it is, in the source, like everything, everything has the atzmi of it and the giluim of it. Is that an example, therefore, that wherever the atzmi? Look, if you have electricity, just one second, let me say, if electricity goes into an appliance, the entire appliance is right now using electricity. The fact is, there are certain parts of the appliance. If you touch it, you get a shock. And other parts of the appliance, you touch it, it won't get a shock. That doesn't take away. It's the, still, the thing is now alive. It's, I'm just using it as an example. The nefesh is a better example, actually. There's no such thing as one, even one fiber of a person's being that's not alive. You can't say the nefesh. You can say the giluim, how much you see of the nefesh. Look, when a person's asleep, you don't see the nefesh. But can you say when you're asleep, you're less alive than when you're, uh, when you're awake? No. You could say you're less functional. You're less, life is less manifest. Someone asleep, you could say, look, it looks like they're maybe not there. But life, the life force does never shift. As I said, is a 20, 30, 40 year old more alive than a five year old? As a matter of fact, you could say some people who have a lot of passion and spirit, you could say they're more alive. But you don't mean more alive as in biologically more alive. You mean they're more, they're more vibrant. They're more passionate. They're more, they're not like, you know, some people feel like they're zombies. But that's Giluyim. Yeah, go ahead. What were you saying? What were you asking? I, I was just mentioning that it, it seems that the, the generator machine example is the idea of that the Koch of the Atmi is found with that same Koch wherever it goes. You know, whatever machine it deals with, that's a koh the atzmi carried through from the generator. That seemed to be a physical... I mean, uh, I, I, I only use the example just to give something for us tangible. Is it a perfect example? No. But I will say this. Yes, electricity, the electricity that goes into uh, billions of volts that go into one of these most powerful machines, and electricity that goes into a light bulb, is there a difference in the electricity? Even if there's more or less, they both are, are coming from something called an electrical uh, charge. Anyway, I don't want to analyze a muscle. That's ridiculous. If, if that muscle doesn't work for you, let's not use it. I just brought it up. He doesn't bring it here. We don't have to analyze a muscle. Only if it works. If it doesn't work, don't use it. That's how you go with a muscle. Here, the two that he brought was the, the flame of a torch. That's the Freb Rasham. Fidik Rebbe added the nefesh. So to, we have to, the point that matter, I think, is very clear that extension and expression, giluim, in other words, are subject to change and diminishment, and atzmi is not. That's the, the bottom line punchline here. Now, this is not a small matter, because as I said yesterday in my introduction to the next section, the next section starts talking about rotzen. So I began to explain, just as an overall, this is relevant on many levels. Let me just explain before we read further inside. So we'll do here is again the same thing. We're going to learn the Ayin Beis as far as it goes. And then we'll go back to Tzadik Dalit. So we'll have both of them working side by side. Can you just okay. let us know when we're going to switch from what's safer to the other two so we can uh, prepare if we want to? 
Of course, I'll point out. Yeah. Ahead of time. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm not going to do line by line. I'm going to, we're going to learn a piece now, like we did yesterday. So okay. we're going to learn Ayin Bayes now. We're not going to learn Sadiq Daud at the bottom of 1147. But I wanted to just review or repeat some things that I said yesterday. This, this is not a small matter, Atzmi and Oyer. This isn't just a technical discussion how the Ayin splits into two. This is actually giving us a picture that goes back all the way to volume one from the beginning of Ayin Bayes of the interface. Remember, for an interface to, be effect, interface to be effective, you have to have representation from both ends. Or else it's not an interface. If you want a translator between Hebrew and English, if he only speaks Hebrew, it's not a translator. If he only speaks English, he's not a translator. So you need something that has something in common with each, each dimension here. So when you speak Atzmi, Atzmi by definition, doesn't lend itself to getting closer to you. It is what it is. So what Atmos did, and this of course is the power of Atmos, he created the concept of expression. Remember, for us it's a given. There's, there's the etzem and there's this expression of the etzem. In Atmos, there are no givens. It's what he wanted to do. Or how he chose it should all more, uh, manifest. And even the word choice is not a good word because you're talking here something that's beyond all these terms, but just using language to try to get a sense how built in Mitzvah Nimtza enters into Mitzvah Nimtza is going to be very difficult for us to really, because we were not there and it's hard and we're not in that re reality. We can talk about it to some extent and try to imagine a bit. So bottom line is this, when we're talking now the concept of Oyer, the very concept of Oyer, is what? What is its purpose? As I said, God doesn't need light. We need light. If not, we're in the dark, on a very physical level. So a light is the form of expressing God in a way that other, another can relate. And all the things we have, whether it's the, so, the sun and its sunlight, or the soul and its giluyim, its faculties, all these are created in order for us to understand how Atmos manifests in dimensions that we can relate to. So that's why it's vital to understand that our existence has fundamentally is dependent on a structure. Existence and structure are not two separate things. No structure, there's no existence. The all of existence is structure. And structure means definitions, parameters, what we talk, mida, gvul, and so on. Even on the highest levels, there has to be some structure. Atzmi, a true etzem, atzmus has no structure. And yet, he infused into existence, like we learned into the yesh anivra, he infused some of his transcendence of structure. The fact that we are a yesh ma'ayin ve'efes ha'muchlet, she'en le'ilu v'siba cheres she'kod like we spoke about, a self-contained reality is, gives us some sense of what atmos is like, but that's beyond structure. But the rest of us are being, the definition of our existence is all structure. We're in the world of Asiya, a human body is made up of structure, the nature is structure, it evolves from Asiya, Ruchnius, Yitzira, Bria, Atsilas, all the way up to the 10 hidden spheres, this is all the art, the structure of existence. So we're going to, obviously, the goal is to have both structure and beyond structure. The beyond structure of Atmos should manifest in the structure of existence. But structure has its own rules. And the rules of structure is what we're learning now, that it's based on diminishment. It's subject to, ch to change and subject to diminishment. And, and, it, and it gets diminished as it goes. That's the whole point. That, without that, there would be no structure. If there's no Milo Mato, if there's no higher quality and lower quality, and there's no Kedima V'ichur, precedent, you have no hierarchy, you have no structure. Even when we say words like Eireng Sof Lifnei Atzimtzum, then there was Atzimtzum, then there was Akav, then there's Ak, then there's Akudim, Nekudim, Vrudim, Atzilas, Bri, Yitzir, Asiya, etc. Right there, Forget about whether it's Gashmi or Ruchnis. Obviously, it's conceptual structure. 
It's not physical space as we learned. But right there, I, I just mentioned a bunch of levels. You can't say that in Atzmus. In Atzmus, it's all the Yechelis. He can do whatever he wants. The Yechelis to create at Atzilis, Abriya, Atzir. In Atzmus, it's indivisible. It's built in Mitzis Nimtzi. You can't even define it altogether as existence as we know it. So Oyer is, is the, now the operative place. You could say it's like the, I don't want to call it the divine laboratory, but it's essentially the divine tapestry upon which God and through which, in which and through which God will use to create a structured existence. But because it's Oyer, it does never loses the integrity of its connection to its source. So you can talk about Oyer, the connection to its source, that's the higher level of ayin, is very revealed. It's revealing the source, atzmus. And um, I'm not talking about now which level of atzmus, this level, that level, but it's definitely revealing that there's a God, there's a source. And there's the air as it relates more to existence, but it's still air. It's the air eliki. You see, when you, you say, asada my modest nivra elam, that God uses my modest, that's ultimately. The Eir and Chayes with as it evolves and manifests into each specific part of existence. So the point here is that this is much more than just the ayin splits into two. It's essentially giving us the whole picture of the interface of how it works. So we have ourselves a, uh, a formula, a, um, a template is the right word that I wanted to use that, that explains many different things. Of course, he's going to develop this further. Now, the fact that he reconnects it back to volume one, to Rotson, and the whole beginning of Ayin Beis, as he says clearly, and the Rebbe Rashab says, is barely ill, and this the ill is not last Maimed. We're talking about um, over a thousand pages ago. Literally. Yeah, over a thousand pages back. That means it's very clear that he wants us to refer to it and reconnect everything coming together. And what's the discussion there? That's what I said yesterday. The discussion is about Er Makif and Er Pnimi, or Sevav Kalam and Mamalakam, or Keser and the Spheres, or in the, in the language of faculties, Rotsun and Keiches Pnimi, the desire for something, and the actual internal faculties. And he's bringing this back here because he's going to explain how Rotsun. Is, um, is, is more of an equalizer. And then there's the specifics as it comes into the details. But we're going to learn it inside. So the connection is not just a, a side connection. It touches the whole essential, um, the essential structure and, uh, and thesis of Ayin Bayes. What line are we up to, please? Excuse me? What line are we up to? What's... Uh... At the bottom of page 1147 in Ayim Bez, I'm going to start again. The line begins. The line begins. Thank you. Right. So now we're going to learn inside. So you see here, he's not just bringing the mimer before, he's saying, the Eilach, which means that Maimer and those that came after it. So he's bringing basically a big chunk of Ayin Beis into this from before. So what did we learn there? He said, Be'inyan HaRotzen. We learned about the Inyan of Rotzen. Shehu Bichinus Er Makif. It's an Er Makif. Remember, the word Makif, as the Alter Rebbe says in Perik Mem Ches in Tanya, does not mean, you say Makif means to surround. You say a Makif, it surrounds. Sometimes we call a yamaka, a makif. It's around. So he says it doesn't mean it surrounds it. It means that it's above it and doesn't, is not consciously experienced within it. So it's more like a hovering transcendent energy as opposed to an imminent one. So an energy that you can relate to is a panimi. It's internalized. It's intimate, if you wish. Uh, a makif remains beyond us, above our heads. Like if you finish a class and you say, I understood something, that would be a pnimi. If you say it was above my head or I, I sensed something, but it wasn't really, I can't repeat it, I, can't, I didn't internalize it, that would be a makif. Just an exa example. 
you know, you'll find very often in, in the Torah mitzvahs, everything is makif and primi. A sukkah surrounds us. We sit inside a sukkah. The dalad mim v'lekachtel nechem is meant to be internalized. A talis is a makif. It surrounds you. You wrap yourself in a talis. Tzitzis, which are the strands, is considered pnimi compared to the talis. So you'll find in, in Torah mitzvahs, you'll find makif and pnimi. The kalim in the mishkan were pnimi. The urias, the walls, are makifim. And this is a common theme because essentially makif and pnimi really explains a fundamental principle of how we grow. What you know today was yesterday, perhaps not makif away. It was above you, beyond you. Then it becomes internalized, and then a new makif emerges. Explains this at length in Vaschan and Lakutatir via Daito. Explains. So as you climb, that which was yesterday a makif becomes a pnimi today, and, and now is a higher makif emerges, and so on. So really, it's a process of growth. You say hakofis on Simchas That's hamshach of makifim. We surround. We go around the bima, and each hakofis is a higher level of makif. Now, makif itself, if you remember, we learned there's many levels. There's ones that are complete equalizers, like the makif akloli of ak. Ak is encompasses all of existence. Even higher than that, the eagle hagodl. You hear the great eagle, the great circle, which is the eagle hagodl that remains after the tzimtzum. It's like the light that's on the edges. It's an equal, perfect circle that encompasses everything. But then there's makifim protim. That's the reshimo, right? No. Eagle hagodl is not reshimo. Eagle hagodl is air. The reshimo is the, is the trace of the air that was there before that remains in the hollow. The Igla Godl is surrounds the Cholo. Okay, now. The Cholo, the Rishimu, right? The Cholo, the Tzimtzum and the Rishimu come often together, but it's really two parts. The Tzimtzum is the concealment, the Rishimu is the trace or the residue or the something that remains concealed, the letters that don't have Ur. But it's not relevant here at all. The Sheder Shakalim, if you wish. The root of the kern. So now there's makif in protim. Keser is always a makif. Keser is a crown. It's above the head. It's never a, a crown. Never enters internally, just like rotsin doesn't enter internally. So rotsin is the way we translate in Chassidus Chabad. The faculty is the faculty of desire, of desire or will, and it doesn't have a localized place. The will is everywhere. And nowhere, in a sense, where is the will? The will manifests in whatever it is that the kesser wants. And then there's makifim prot. Anyway, let's read inside, and I'll explain as we go. And as I said, he tells us exactly where he's referring to, so we could always look there. Should something be missing? Just for the record, we'll learn this. The Friedrich Kereba actually goes back to those Maimorim in Sadiq Dalit and cites entire sections from the Maimorim and early Ayin Beis that the Rebbe Rashab is, is, is referring to. So the Rebbe Rashab is not going to quote what he said back there. The Friedrich Rebbe does. So it's going to be interesting. The Friedrich Rebbe is actually going to lift pieces. I remember when I was learning it, I just saw entire pieces. I remembered that it's from somewhere. I couldn't, I, I thought it was from here, like the rest of it. No. So he quotes not just the Ayin Beis here, he actually quotes the Ayin Beis from back there, the Maimorim of Kiseitse Ha'alef back in Ayin in volume one. So here's what we learned, he says. It's a transcendent energy. That's the word I like to use, transcendent. I mean, it could technically means the surrounding energy. Or you could, transcendent seems like it could be a good word because it transcends the local and immediate presence. So so if you may remember, I don't know if you do, but literally on page two of Ayin Beis, if you remember the first page, he talks about the three ksarim that God bound. It says, B'Shah Sheikdimu, that's the beginning of the Hemshech. B'Shah Sheikdimu Yisrael, Nasa Nishma is kosher lehem shleishik ksarim, the Ebeshter. God bound for them, or, or you could say crafted for them, 
weaved, weaved for them three crowns. Echad Kenegad Nasa, Echad Kenegad Nishma, and Echad Kenegad Hagdomis Nasa Lenishma. That's what it says. That's the first lines in Ayin Beis. One corresponding to doing, one corresponding to Nishma that we will hear and understand, and one corresponding to the fact that they preceded Nasa Lenishma. And then he asks the questions there. But then he says that there are three interpretations in Kesar. I'm bringing this because this is, this is really the whole, this is how the whole Ayin Beis begins. The three interpretations of Kesar, Kesar is number one, is Kesar as silence or pause. And he brings the Psukim there that, uh, that demonstrates what Kesar means. The second interpretation of Kesar is um, the, uh, uh, a, a crown above. I'm trying to remember what Lushan he uses there. And the third is that it surrounds. It's makif. So he explains that these three interpretations later he explains and Vayiga Shayin Gimel that these three levels, these three are uh, three levels in makif. One is the, the when it surrounds, it's already connecting to what it's surrounding. The when it's above is a higher level. It's like beyond that the structure, and the Kesser silence is the highest level. That's completely like Atik, Primius Atik, that's beyond, beyond. So there's Kesa as it relates to imminence. There's Kesa as it's transcendent and does not relate to imminence. And then there's Kesa beyond that as well. Then he explains that Kesa, what does Kesa mean? Kesa in Kechis is Rotsen. And he says these words. He says, this is the first interface of all interfaces. Allah Beritseine, that God desired to create. If he didn't have a Ratzin, we have no connection with him. So even though there's higher levels than Ratzin, which we'll learn later in Ayin Beis, but in, in that part, he talks about the first thing you need is a Ratzin. If you and I want to have a relationship, you have to want and I have to want. Forget about the relationship itself. That's already an outgrowth. But if there's no Ratzin, there's no will. But they say, if there's a will, there's a way. If there's no will, you don't move. No, someone's not interested, that means there's no desire. So desire is the first step in Shtalshus, at least, where Keser becomes the connector. And he says there clearly, there's a Ratzon Klali. God wants, like I said yesterday, a general desire he wants, He wants a, a world, a Shad in Shtalshus, and a world that will be a home for him. But we don't have any details in that. If you were the architect or the builder or the contractor, you'd say to God, okay, that's very nice. Can you tell me what, you, what exactly you want? And then comes the Keser of Keser Kloli. After the Keser Kloli of the general Rots and Kloli, there's the Ritzainus Pratim. I want to have a Tzimtzum. I want to have a Kav. I want a Rishimu, a Kav. I want Ak. I want a Kudim, a Kudim, a Kudim. I want a Tzil, a Toyu, Tikkun, a Tzil, a Zbri, a Tzil, a Siyah. In each of them, I want Chachma Bina Das and Chesed Gvura Tefes Netzach Hedges Said Malchus. And here I want Persoyis. Rotson now, now breaks into details. Rotson Proti, which is the Keser Proti of each world and each dimension. And not every world, not only does every world have a Keser, there's Keser of Bria, the Rotson for Bria, there's Keser for Yitzira, there's also a Keser in each Svira, the Rotson for Chachma, that's Keser Sheba Chachma, Keser Sheba Bina. Keser Sheba Chesed, etc. I didn't mention Das for a reason. It's not relevant here because Das and Keser are interchangeable. That's why it remains 10 spheres. But that's another discussion. Now, that's what he says. So now, this Rotson, Yesh Bezer Rotson Kloli, there's a general desire. I want something, but you haven't broken down what specific thing you want. The Ritzain is Paratim. And then there's specific desires. The Ima Yes, and even though the Bechol Hamadregis who Bchinas Rotsin on all levels, whether it's a specific level like I want I want Bria or Yitzira, I'm just using that example, or a Rotsin Kali, wherever it is on any level, they're all level of Rotsin. It's all what he wants. The Aim Bezesh Shinri Beetsa Madregosa, and there's no fundamental change in the core level of the Rotsin. Because it's what he wants. Like I said yesterday, I say it now again. 
you want to take a walk or you want to uh, d- 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 eat breakfast, then there's another, and then you want to sit down and learn Taylor. They're very different than Rutsenis, right? One Rutsen is about m- m- material, um, m- menial, um, trivial matters. And the other is learning Taylor. So, so there's a big difference. But the Etza Madre Gossen, it's still, with, from the point of view, your desire, your desire doesn't matter whether one is much bigger than the other. He says, Nevertheless, the Ratzin in one thing that's on a lower level is miyut b'malosan, it's diminished in its quality. The kamoishu b'chines Ratzin prati, the way it manifests as a specific desire for something, that at least causes it to be a source. In other words, if I said to you, I want a house, and I don't say any details, you can't really go build a house for me because you want to sit down and say, what, 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 what do you want? Do you want the house to be um, 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet or you want it to be 100,000 feet by 100,000 feet? You know, it's a very big difference. How many rooms? What do you want them to look like? So though the Ratzon Kloli is a general desire, but you're not going to have any details. Comes the Ratzon Prati, where you specifically spell out what you want, specifics. So only when you have a Ratzon Prati does it become a mocker. Even though the Ratzon Kloli, the general desire is the driving force. Without that, the whole thing wouldn't begin. I come to you and I say, listen, I'm building for you a house. And with these details, I say, who asked you to build a house for me? Who says I want it? So we have to have a Ratzon Kloli because you need first a desire. There's no desire, there's nothing doing. But you can't call that Ratzon Kloli a mocker. What let's define mocker means an immediate source. It's a Ratzon Kloli. It's an overall overarching desire. And you don't call it a mocker yet. Remember we talked about the two levels of ayin. The ayin of the Yeshamiti, you can't call a mocker yet. It's too distant from the product. It is the beginning because it's everything originates from there. Without that, you wouldn't have anything. But you can yet call it a mocker prati, a specific source, an identifiable. Here is what here's a specific desire that I want for this specific detail. The Ratsna Kloli ain't a The general desire is not yet defined as you can't call it, you can't yet call it a source. Remember the word mocker in English means everything. Anything that you say God is the source of existence. But can you go, when a source also implies that has a relationship and is commensurate to the thing it's a source to. Like you wouldn't compare a sun is the source of sunlight. Would you say God is a source of existence like the sun is the source of sun? No. Because the sun and the sunlight were both created and the sun was created to give off light. Atmos, as we learned, is not defined not by Moir, and not even by Bayre, as we discussed, as a term, as a description. Not as a description of what he's, what, how he can create. So you can't define as such. So that's why when we say it's not a mokir, it does not mean in the general words and semantics that, of course, God is the source. But you can't define him. He's too, he's too distant from being, he's too removed from being a source to a specific thing. So the Rotson, here we're not even talking about Atmos. Here we're talking about the Rats and Kloli. It's too removed. Like if, if you said, I want a house, that's not enough. You can, that is not enough to be able to build a house. You need to have the details. The Rats and Kloli ain't a beginning smoke or a dying. You can't call it yet an immediate, let's call it identifiable and direct source to the product. But how it comes into a specific desire where you, there's details, that now becomes a source to bring it into action, into actuality. And without that, you do not have the source and the actuality. So you have Rats and Kloli is the general driving force. Rats and Prati is called the Mokir. And that leads to an actual product. And this is true in every area of life, every area of life. You want to write a book, what kind of book? 
specifics. What's the name of it? What chapters? What's the theme? Ratzon Kloli is general, and Ratzon Proti is mocker. Sheyi Adover Bepel. Bahainu says the Rebbe Rashab. This means Shegam Ba'ir Hasevev. She so now uses the word sevev. Sevev and makif are interchangeable. In Kabbali, usually it's makif and pnimi, or igulim and yesher, circles and lines. And in uh, chsidis, it's sevev kalam and mamalakalam, which is from Zoyar. Well, chsidis uses, but it's interchangeable in the theme of it, because sevev means to surround, and makif means to surround. So the same he says, v'hainu shegamba ira sevev. Also in this transcendent energy, there's also levels, like we see here with Ratzin. There's Ratzin is Pratim. In the beginning of the transmission or the expression, in the beginning, the Sevev is in a form of an Er Kloli. It's a general transcendent energy that is a Ratzin Kloli, like he said. And the way it extends and expresses itself, or you could say it extends and spreads out, but it, it doesn't mean physically spread. He means, obviously, the way it extends and manifests or expresses or flows. Page 1148. Yes, sir. As it continues and to 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 extend and express and 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 uh, extend um, transmit. So we see that sevev he says from this means hainu sevev as is has has levels. In the beginning of its expression or transmission, it's a krotz, it's a kloli. Until it is extends further, it becomes a proti. It becomes specific desire for the detail. We'll soon see how that comes back to our discussion of Oyer and of the two levels of Ayin. So just let's be patient here. Even yes. in a Savior, you have the Prati? What? Even in a Savior, you have the Prati, the Ratzin Prati? Read, read what he just said. He says, Vahainu. There's different distinct levels. In the beginning, it's Er Kloli, and then it comes into Arats and Prati. That's what he says. If you learn, I, that's why I gave the whole introduction of the three levels of Keser. If you learn back in volume one, he talks about it at length, how in Makifim there's levels. It's not quite like levels like Primi, but there's also levels there because it's how the makif relates. Let, let's see where he's going to go here. We'll explain whatever needs to be explained. will be explained. But that was a big, big part of the theme in volume one, how in makifim there's also levels just like there is in pnimim, except they're transcendent levels. The yeshlemer, this is a yeshlemer. It's like a chidush. And you can say, the zesha era seviv, Okay, let me, before we read, let me explain. Remember, and this is vital again, in any process of growth, you need to have makif and primi. I mentioned as you grow, what, you, what, what yesterday was a makif beyond you, hopefully today has become internalized. Think of climbing a ladder. You climb on one rung, so you're there now. You're presently there. But above your head, there's another rung, and another rung, and another rung. So then the next day you climb, or the next moment you climb the next rung, then there's a rung above you. So in other words, even as you own and internalize experiences, there's always something that's beyond you. The Baal Shem Tov said, for every question I have an answer, and for every answer I have another question. This is not going in circles. This is the process of intellectual growth. That today, the question of yesterday was answered, but then you realize, one second, now I have a bigger question. 
literally like climbing a mountain or a, a ladder and seeing wider and broader horizons all the time. Any true process of intelligence works that way. I'll just say as a, as a footnote, which is important, we human beings, either because we're lazy or because we like to own things and control, we think we're going to reach a destination and then I'll get it. Well, what do you think it says? What does that mean? Because that's what real growth is. You never rest. I know that's not that's disconcerting for many of us because we think that at some point is going to be retirement. So, well, let me just to console you. The Rebbe once asked, I think the Masha says it. He says, okay, it says, sometimes it says, Tzadikim ain't lehem manucha, but two different gersai. The, the question is asked, the Masech Tatamid, it says, Yem shekulei Shabbos, a manucha lechai elamit. That manucha will be lechai elamit forever. Shabbos a manucha. Here it says, ain't lehem manucha. Is it, which one is it? Lei be'elam hazav, lei be'elam haba. It says by ain't lehem manucha. And then it says, no, us in the future, there'll be. So some try to interpret Elam Haba means Gan Eden. But that's not a, a, an adequate answer. So the answer, I think the Masha, the Rebbe for sure brings it, is a beautiful answer. There's two types of lack of Menucha. One is called anxiety, one is called re, uh, uh, anxiety. person feels constantly anxious. Another is called restlessness. It's not the same thing. Is they will be at peace with the fact that they're not at peace. It's a healthy restlessness. It means they're not dead, God forbid. They're always eager and seeking to grow. Now, you could feel pain by that and say, I'm never, you know, not satisfied. That would be an unhealthy version. I feel, I feel um, inadequate. I feel weak. I feel stupid. And it demoralizes you, which is why many people say, okay, you know what? I finally reached the, the, the finish line. Now I can rest. By a tzaddik, lack of rest is not an unhealthy thing. It's not that they forever be tired and forever be exhausted and never reach the end. They are at peace with a lack of peace, with, a, with basically at peace with the restlessness of their soul to constantly grow. So let's go back to Makif and Primi. So it works through Makif and Primi. Yesterday's makif is today's panimi, and today a new makif was revealed. The question then is, do these, how do they ever meet? Or more, or better way to put it is, a makif seems to be all rooted, and all the makifim are rooted in one place. It says in places, kol aksarim All the keser, every keser connects to each other. Their own track, they all go to the eagle agadol. On the other hand, Pnimi all trace their source to the Kav. The Kav is Yesha, the Kav is hierarchy, structure. A line is not a circle. A circle is infinite, and it always surrounds, it's always outside of. A, a Kav is a Pnimi. It enters, it's like the thread, the Kav, the thread, the line that creates each level of structure. So you're saying that Makif becomes, Makif, has Rutsain as Pratim, seemingly Makiv transcends Pratim. Maybe that's what you were asking. Now, the truth is, he asked all this back in volume one. Here, the Rebbe Rashab says, Here's the word that when you say, because seemingly Sevev is an equalizer. That's the whole point of a transcendent energy. A, a transcendent energy. What do you mean that there's distinct levels? He says, Hulafi. It's because Sham Shahu Derachair Pnimi. In other words, the makif, the save of its stone, yes, is an equalizer. But because it transmits through the air pnimi, in other words, it's not just a makif here and a pnimi there. The makif uses the pnimi as it, it flows and transmits through the pnimi, as we're gonna say in a moment, Ukiadua Shagama Igulim Nimshachim in Akav. As it's known that also the igulim, remember igul is another word for makif, the circles also come from the kav. 
like it says in Eitz Chaim, Shakav Nimshech U Misagel, Vechazer Venimshech Vechazer Misagel. So if I had a picture, I would make it like this. The Tzimtzum contracts all the air, conceals it. It's now, you see a, it's not physical, but conceptually a space that is void, the void of divine, revealed divine consciousness. That's a cholo. Yes, there's a residue, there's a trace, a shima there. That's not relevant to our discussion. The next step comes a kav, right? What's the kav? A thin line, as the Arizal in Eitz Chaim, there's that image which we've pointed out a few times. A thin line emerges from where? From the Eirein Sof Lifnat Simpson that is now like a bagel surrounding this empty black hole. A thin line, and this thin line is going to be the stylus. It's going to be the paintbrush with which God will create everything. So this Eir is Eir, Kav is Eir. But now it's a earth dak umitsumtsum. It's narrow and limited. It's still extremely intense and powerful. But relative to Eden Sof Lifnat Simtsum, it's limited. As we learned at length in volume one, the different shittas. Is the kav bligvul? Is it gvul? Is it a combination of both? Because on one hand, it's light. It's not keli. It's light. On the other hand, it's a defined light. It's not Eden Sof a kav is a structure. There's a milo mata. That's what makes it a kav. A, a, a ray of light is not like diffused light that's all over the place. It's a concentrated laser energy. Here's the catch. So the Arizal says in Eitz Chaim that now there's a big eagle called the eagle agodl. What does the kav do? So you would think the kav is going to create structure. Chochme, bina, das, ak, and then the next level, Akudim, and then Akudim, and then Atsilus, Brudim, and Bria. The Kav will continue to diminish and create existence. What about the Makifim? Who creates the Ksodim? The Rotsen for Ak, the Rotsen for Atsilus, the Keser and Rotsen for Atsilus, the Keser and Rotsen for Bria, Yitzir. Where does that come from? So you could think it's coming from its own track from the Eagle of Godel, from the first Makif. That light that surrounds that whole empty space says no, says that is on no. It is the Kav that also carries the power of Eagle, it says. So the Kav extends and then it turns into a circle. The Kav creates a circle. That's what he says. Nimshech umisagel. It extends and then turn, the musagl becomes like a circle. Then it continues. Then it continues to the next level and creates another. Again, another circle. So now you have not just the air primi of Chachmembina or of the worlds, you have both air primi and air. So the Kav creates the air primi of Chachmem. First, it creates the makif of the Kesar of Chachmem, that's the eagle. Then, it, that, then the primi of Chachmem. Then it continues and creates the keser and eagle of Bina. And then it continues the, and the primi of Bina. And, this, and going on, the same thing with each level, level after level. So the kav now is the brush that doesn't just create the, the, the primi, the imminent energy. It also is the force through which makif manifests into existence. So what do you see from here? That seva is nimshech through primi. Through Mamala. Makif is Nimshach through Pnimi. And he says that's the Yeshlamer. That doesn't say Neitzchaim. Yeshlamer is that's why Makifim have levels. Because the Makif is not completely apart from the Pnimi. The Pnimi for sure has levels. It's defined by structure. But since the Kav, which is a Pnimi, is the force through which the Makifim manifest through Arishtalshlis, so that causes that the Makif also will have levels. So therefore, there's the Rotson for Chochmeh. The Rotson for Bina, the Rotson for Atsilas, the Rotson for Bria. And because of this, and because the Igulim are coming through the Kav, not on their own. If they came on their own, you could say they're all equal. There's no distinctions between them. But then it wouldn't relate to the structure of existence. You want to have, remember, in the interface, you want transcendence 
to speak to the imminent and the imminent to speak to the transcendent. So the Kav is now becoming, in a sense, like a Shatchan, becoming like an interface between Makif and Primi because it, the, makif, the Kav itself is not a Makif, but the makif, power of Makif travels through the Kav. It's like this is the transmitter of all the energy from above, both the, the air Primi of Lifneat Simpsom and the air Makif of Lifneat Simpsom, which we'll discuss more. She says, and that's why that you can't, you can't, in a demer, they're not similar. The igulim of ak, which is the ksarim or the ritzenus of ak, the iguli atik for arich, the igulim in atik and arich in keser. Behind the chinus keser datzilus, atik and arich is keser datzilus. The okay. I could read a few more lines. Let me read a few more lines just to finish this point here. It says the Ikule Ak, he's going to explain the difference. Hushemakifim Klolos Elemis. The role of the circles of Ak, which means the Kesarim of Ak, the Rotsun of Ak, is Shemakifim Klolos Elemis. Their role is to encompass and surround, not surround, but to transcend and encompass Klolos Elemis, the whole, all the general world. And they are in a state of removed from the world. They're beyond. Not completely beyond like Lifnei HaTzimtzum, because then the Tzimtzum didn't accomplish anything. But relatively, it's beyond the worlds. He's literally bringing everything from Ayin Bey's volume one night. I mean it. Because it has an effect. We learned in Ayin Bey's volume one that the Makif is not, he asked the question, what do you need a Makif if it's removed? So he says, because it affects something. And he says in the parentheses here, what does it affect? Bittl. Something removed, even though we can't relate to it, but in a distant way, it's creating a certain element of effect of Bittl, Behelem. In a concealer, She'ena Nirgish B'Nevroim. That's not felt by Nevroim. So you could ask the question, if it's not felt, what's the purpose? So that question is answered already in other places where you say every day a Baskel comes out. And calls everybody shuva bonim shavim. Calls everybody to do shuva. So everyone asks the question: the Baal Shem Tov, What's the point if no one hears it? So it says you don't hear it, but your neshama, the mazel of the neshama, hears it. So even though it's we don't feel it, but it has an impact. And somewhere it, it will bring the bitl we have in our lives is coming from the concealed impact. You can call it the superconscious impact of the makifim of ak. Where's Sham? Sham? He's going back to volume one. What did he say there? Everything that stands before you, everything upright before you will prostrate, will bow to Hashem. Where does that come from? He says from the Makiv Kloli of Ak. So that is the Gulim of Ak. But there ain't a Dema. They're not similar to the Gulim of Atik and Arach. The Gulim of Keser. And the gulim of keser mean keser of atzilus. Hey, makifim datzilus. These are the transcendent forces, and that are above atzilus. Befrat, specifically of atzilus. Ubuulosum ubchinus gili vehergish yeser. And this makif has a more direct conscious effect on us. A more revealed and sensed and discernible effect. And so we see from this, there's not Damon, even though they're both Igulim, Igulim of Ak, both, both Rotson, both Keser in a way. Nevertheless, there's a distinction. Why? It's Yeshlema from the top of the page, because also the Makiv comes through Er Pnimi. That's why it affects that the Makifim should also be different. Basically, he's saying that if it didn't go through the Kav, they, the Makifim would be all equal and it would have the same impact on us. But that's not the Kavon. You want the Makif to have a relationship with the Pnimi. Yes, in a form of Makif. But now the Rotsen, the, the distinct, the distinct Rotsenus Protim, have more relationship to the Pnimi as opposed to the same Kloli, the Rotsen Kloli, and the higher levels which to have a less relationship, at least consciously. 
And that's due to the fact that they all travel through the air pnimi of the Kav. Okay. He's going to give a muscle for this, but let's stop here. The top of page 1148.